Alito, and welcome to Native Chalk Talk, a podcast by Natives for all. Here, we're keeping our Native ancestors' stories and history alive, while also sharing with you our Native cultures, traditions, and more. I'm Rachel Youngman, a Choctaw originally from Anadarko, Oklahoma. I hope you'll enjoy this journey with me as we learn from our Native American guests. And stay tuned for the end of each episode, where we'll talk about some great ways to support Native causes and or Native-owned businesses. Let's get started. More than a maker. More than an athlete. More than a pastor. Chata Ilifinachili. I am Choctaw proud. We are the Choctaw Nation, and together we're more. The year was 1967. Crowds of equal parts Native Americans and non natives lined Main Street in the little bustling town, hoping to catch a glimpse of the culture, dances, and regalia of our American Indian people. In Adarko, Oklahoma, population just over 6,000 was rightfully deemed the Indian capital of the nation due to the largest count of American Indian residents per capita than anywhere in the world. Friends within the community said howdy, tipping their hats not just to each other, but also to the outsiders from all over the country and even all over the world who had come to attend the much anticipated annual Indian Expo. That Oklahoma hospitality that still exists today was felt by all who traveled near and far to experience this gathering of Kiowa, Comanche, Apache, Port Sill Apache, Ponca, Pawnee, Delaware, Cheyenne, Arapaho Caddo, Osage, Sac, Fox, Odo, Missouri, Wichita, and 50 other tribes. Yes, the Indian Expo was a unique, one of a kind, week long event occurring every August. And it was drawing in the likes of celebrities like John Wayne, Jim Thorpe, Willie Nelson, Crystal Gale, and some of the most famous of the Kiowa artists, the Kiowa Five, like Stephen Mopope and Monroe Satoke, and surprisingly, Hollywood actors who wanted to observe Native Americans displaying their dancing, culture, jewelry, ceremonies, and regalia, and more. Even a Japanese TV company filmed these events as part of a series on people of the world. Both the locals and travelers in the tens of thousands would spend the week camping in teepees, tents, RVs, and trailers at the Anadarko Fairgrounds. One year even saw 75,000 attendees. Strangers from around the country became gathered over campfires with songs, dancing, and good old-fashioned camaraderie and newly found friendships. The days and evenings were filled with native dancing, and pretty baby competitions, tribal pageants, horse racing, arts and craft shows, tournaments such as Indian softball, bowling, golf, and more. But first, an event like no other would kick off the week-long event on day one. Proudly parading down the streets of Anadarko were the Mud Men, the Apache ghost dancers, tribal princesses, Riverside Indian school students and teachers, various tribal representatives, native men, women and children on horses, and sometimes there were celebrities. Celebrities like in the year 1967, who came to town to join in the parade and wave a friendly hello to the cheering onlookers. These particular celebrities of this particular year were escorted through the streets in a convertible by Robert Goombay Jr., president of the Expo. Riding in the back seat was a man with a glistening smile, cowboy hats, and a fringed cowboy shirt, dazzling the crowd with the wave of his hand, warming the hearts of the parade goers. To the left of the cowboy was a lovely blonde haired woman with kind eyes and a dress with apple prints. She also waved to the onlookers who were thrilled to see the charming and famous couple making their way down the streets of the little native town. Sitting right between the cowboy and his wife with the kind eyes was a young girl also wearing a dress with apple print. And so they rode in the American Indian Expo parade, gracing the townspeople and the visitors with their lovely demeanor and even their own excitement to be part of this unprecedented annual event. Perhaps the child may have asked, who is that cowboy, Mama? To which she would have responded, well, that's the king of the cowboys, Roy Rogers, and his superstar cowgirl wife, Dale Evans. That year, the Indian Expo named Roy Rogers Outstanding American Indian, a title bestowed on a carefully selected individual each year. The Oakland Tribune in California wrote on Friday, August 11th, 1967, 
Roy Rogers is named number one Indian. Cowboy movie star Roy Rogers has been picked for that honor and will be featured Monday at a downtown parade opening a six day run of the 36th annual American Indian Exposition. Rogers, part Choctaw, will be presented a leather scroll at the exposition Monday night in recognition of his selection as the number one Indian of the year. He will be accompanied by his wife, Del Evans, and one of their daughters, Dodie. Dodie, the young, quiet girl sitting between her parents in the car with her apple print dress, shoulder length, shiny black hair, and coffee colored eyes. She seemed a little unsure of the crowd surrounding her and stuck close to her mom in the matching apple print dress. Listeners, I have the honor today of visiting with that daughter of cowboy singers and actors Roy Rogers and Del Evans, Dodie Rogers. Dodie, welcome to Native Chalk Talk. Thank you. Proud to be so, here and listen to that story. That's amazing. So although you were born in Texas and grew up in California, you live in Alabama today, correct? Yes. And how did you get to Alabama? <laughs> A man. <laughs> Actually, <laughs> um, I met the man who is now my husband and in california there he is he... the timing's right he just came in the room, y'all. <laughs> hi john <laughs> I, I have to admit like to our listeners john was so kind because we had before we got started it got hot in the room dodie was like where's that fan and john had to roll around on the bed to go to the other side get the fan out he is a good husband dodie <laughs> thank you i think so too <laughs> I also want to point out that, um, you know, we know that your mom and dad were Roy Rogers and Dell Evans, and you're wearing a beautiful necklace today that I was asking about. Why don't you tell us how that necklace came about? Um, my mom passes on to me um, before she passed away because she wanted to make sure that I would get certain things of hers. But my dad had um, went in with some I'm not sure how many people, but he had a mine, a turquoise mine, hmm. and in Arizona or New Mexico, I'm not sure well, where, and uh, he had it made for her, and um, she passed it on to me. That's so special. I'm glad you're wearing that today. For those who are listening and not watching this video, um, it's beautiful turquoise, and it looks kind of like a, a mm -hmm. Navajo style, correct? Something something like that, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Now tell us about John. So how did you guys meet and how did you end up in Alabama? Well, he came out, it was about 2000. Um, he works for NASA in Huntsville, Alabama. Wow. And I was in the living in the high desert and he had come out there for a, a project he worked on and met him at um, a church event. And then we just kept communicating because he was sent back home we had to go back to Alabama and we just kept communicating until uh we had to decide what to do yeah. so I vis visited out mm -hmm. here and decided to make the move well it sounds then like my a children good, followed right sounds like a good decision and uh you yes. snagged yourself a caught yourself a NASA man so I can't blame you for that <laughs> Now your adoptive dad, Roy Rogers, who I prefer to just call your dad because he truly was the only dad you ever knew and raised and loved you. So your dad, Roy Rogers, he was Choctaw, correct? Yes, he was. Okay, and you once told me that your dad was from, um, the Choctaw side was perhaps from his dad's side. And then a newspaper article I read said he was from, the Choctaw side was from his mom's side of the family. And that just goes to show you how often the media does um, get information wrong. In fact, I found a lot of wrong information when I was doing some research about your family. And I also read from an incorrect article that he was one fourth Choctaw, but that's, that's not correct, right? Well, <laughs> we are not exactly sure. Um, he said he didn't have a lot. Okay. And we thought less than one eighth, but um, I have not been able to research enough to find out exactly where it comes in. So I, I really don't know. It never well, seemed 
that important at the time, but um, no, how would you find out? Not. So yeah, today they have all the DNA testing and which I took to. Oh, tested, you took, so. yeah, yeah. We, I, yeah, I was about to say, oh, what did it show? But we already know what it shows because, um, <laughs> um, okay, did he ever talk about his American Indian heritage? Not a lot. Um, more that he wanted us involved in Native American, well, we called it Indian at that time. Yeah. So um, he would contact he and mom would all contact people and befriend um native american heritage um what they had to what they had out there <clears throat> excuse mm -hmm. me research and um they got to know more people and meet other people they um found out they bought me books and records and albums and um they even looked into camps, Indian camps that they could send me to so I could learn more. And so that Great. was, took up a lot of our um, background. <laughs> yeah, that's good. I love that they embraced it. Um, an aspect I love about your connection with your dad, even though there isn't that blood relation, is that you're Choctaw as well, like me. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and didn't your your adoption paper say there was um like they thought that they knew what your makeup of your genetics were? Yes, for the longest time I thought I was half Choctaw, a quarter Scottish, and a quarter Irish. Mm -hmm. And then when I had met my grandmother, she said, No, that's not right. She said, You're a full blood. Hmm. So, and she said that I ought to know because <laughs> she knew exactly well, she knew what her her background and also the my biological father. But it wasn't Absolutely. until I had the DNA testing done that I found what um, what I actually was. Wow, oh. which was <laughs> um, eighty percent um, Native American, twelve percent Asian and 2% West Russian. Okay. So yeah, your your grandma was right that you were more native than they had said on your paperwork. Mm -hmm. So that's interesting. Now they call you Dodie, but what's your legal name? It's Mary. I was, uh, when I was adopted, I, uh, my mom, my biological mom, I think had said that she wanted me to be called Mary. And their last name was Frazier. So I was okay. Mary Frazier. And um, then my <laughs> adoptive mom, my mom, <laughs> um, called me Mary Little Doe. Aww. So, but my name is Mary Rogers Patterson now. Okay. Legally. And the, the Little Doe turned into Dodie affectionately, right? <laughs> yes. That's so cute. I can just see that the, I, I even think about the names that I called my daughter and even my dog, you know, it's like turns into these cutesy <laughs> little names. <laughs> so this is news to you about you and your parents being at the Indian Expo in Anadarko, right? Or did you know about that? No, I, well, I didn't remember. Um, we've yeah. been to so many places that I really could not tell you where we've been. Um, totally. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you were Parades. a teenager at the time. Yeah. I I wouldn't remember. So yeah, and it's rare that I get to bring news to my guests that they didn't already know. So it was kind of fun to share <laughs> this with you. But so Anadarko is my hometown, and every year it was such a treat to go to the American Indian Expo and Parade. And I always knew the story of Roy Rogers and Jell Evans riding in that parade, even though that was a few years before I was born. And the Anadarko Daily News also wrote about the big expo event in 1967, and it read, with an all Indian color guard from Fort Sill leading the way, a parade featuring cowboy movie star Roy Rogers will open the American Indian Exposition at one o'clock Monday. Rogers, who was named Outstanding Indian of 1967, his wife Del Evans, and teenage daughter Dodie will occupy places of honor in the parade. Rogers, who exposition official said is one quarter Choctaw. There's the one quarter thing again. Don't know if it's true. We will receive a leather scroll and so on. 
Skipping ahead, it says they'll stay in Chickasha with um, some other details that were in there. And when I say not sure if the one quarter thing is true, was it 132nd that they've talked about too? That's, I've heard that number too. So yeah, I'm it, really... it's crazy. It's, either way, we know he was part Choctaw. Um, and it's just kind of interesting to know that you both were, were Choctaw. So yes, <laughs> um, that's cool. So my mom told me a story that my stepdad who passed away a few years back had told her. So he owned one of the buildings in downtown Anadarko and it had a restaurant on the top floor and the restaurant had long since closed when he bought it. But he was told that you and your mom and dad had dinner up there one evening while you're in town. And that's hearsay, but interesting. We know there was a dumb waiter in that building when my stepdad owned it that went from the bottom um, to the restaurant on the top floor. So um, you probably don't recall that dinner either, right? I mean, that you were a teenager back then. Yes, yeah, a teenager with their head in the clouds all the time. But right. I do remember <laughs> a couple of places that we went where they had a dumb waiter, which mm. maybe they should think of a better term. <laughs> it sounds funny saying that. <laughs> You know, we're, who came up and with that term? <laughs> I think it's a pretty smart waiter. You know, it goes up and down. It's very helpful. <laughs> yeah. But uh, because those things would fascinate me. And it's yeah, not right. something you see all the time. So, That's yeah, so I, funny. I'm not sure if that was the place or not. But yeah, maybe yeah. a little bit of a memory. We'll, you know, who knows? Mm -hmm. it's, it's always fun when people bring stuff up that you're like, oh, wait, maybe I do remember. I don't know. But yeah. So, so there once was a famous Kiowa photographer, Horace Pula. Pula lived in my hometown in Anadarko for a while. And for 50 years, he passionately documented Kiowas during a time of transition from the traditional Indian world into the modern world in Oklahoma. In 1967, he took a photo of Roy Rogers, Del Evans, and yourself, Dodie, in the Indian Expo Parade. You can see in that photo, Robert Goombay Jr. too, escorting them through the parade in a convertible. So Goombay was president of the expo and was instrumental in its success. And then the Pula and Goombay families were and still are really well-known names in the area. So I also reached out to Audra Vance, curator at the Anadarko Heritage Museum, and she was kind enough to provide a photo and a newspaper article of you and your mom and dad at the events. So special thanks to you, Audra, at the museum. I'm really grateful for your help. And by the way, listeners, go check out the Anadarko Heritage Museum. There's thousands, literally thousands of historical photos from the area documenting the Plains tribes and the community of Anadarko, as well as some rare artifacts preserved over many years. It's one of my favorites, and I've been going there since I was a little girl. It's actually what, what taught me to love history. So I'll be sure to share these photos of Dodie, Roy, and Dell on my Native Chalk Talk <laughs> Facebook page. <laughs> So Dodie, when you saw, I sent the pictures to you, what did you think yeah. when you saw your matching <laughs> apple dresses and what'd you think of that? Well, I just, I love seeing pictures because I have so few of my own mm. personally. And um, so when I see them, it's like, oh, wow. Yeah, I'm kind of remembering things. Yeah. And I remember my mom liked to uh, dress, not dress us up like twins or anything, but she did right. like us to, and I wasn't always, um, that thrilled <laughs> with the uh, wearing the same kind of clothes <laughs> but you always are making to, me wear this yeah you know, i mean i'm a teenager you know right but exactly tried, tried to get it to where it would um look more what a teenager would wear than what she would wear <laughs> Yeah, so. I can see where like her dress is more frilly and right. has a, a dress that flares out. And then yours mm -hmm. is more straight down, but it still has the apple mm -hmm. prints on the sleeves. I just, yeah, when I saw yeah. that, I was like, oh my God, they're matching. That's so cute. <laughs> well, and then yes. um, the, the, the photo that's in the newspaper that you're looking at, I think it's interesting that you're wearing a necklace in that. That's the same necklace your mom is wearing in a different photo. So you would obviously yeah. have borrowed her necklace or vice versa um, on the on one of the other days. But also, I thought it was interesting that um, when you look at the NewYorker.com, where it shows photos of who from Horace Pula, they have you written as Mary Doty D O T Y, uh, no, Maria Doty oh. D O T Y, oh. and they list you as Navajo. <laughs> Oh, so that's oh, why I was wow. thrown off for a little bit. Cause I was like, 
when I first saw the photos, like, I know she's not Navajo and I know that's not how she spells her name. So th- is that the same Dodi that we're talking about? So anyway, <laughs> pretty interesting. <laughs> Yes, so yeah, <laughs> again, they get it wrong a lot and, and, you know, it happens. So, and that's what makes it hard when we're all trying to research our ancestors too, is mm-hmm. the papers get things wrong a lot. So, but the Indian Expo began in 1932 as an Indian fair and was later renamed the American Indian Exposition in 1935. Today, with the exception of a pause due to the COVID pandemic, as well as some other issues, the American Indian Exposition hopes to continue on. Attendance has waned over the years, and the tribes and locals wish to regain attendance like the glory years once the expo hopefully comes back to life in August of 2023. So it's hard for folks like you and me to believe that some people may not know who Roy Rogers is. And I've got some young listeners. Thank you, young listeners, for joining in the show and being so supportive. And some do and some don't know about this legend that is Roy Rogers, and that's okay. So let's talk about your dad, Roy Rogers, the star, because I think people of any age will find you and your family story fascinating and inspiring. So... Roy Rogers was born Leonard Franklin Sly in 1911 in Cincinnati, Ohio. He was a cowboy singer, radio star, and actor from a young age, even up until his death, and was rightfully crowned the king of the cowboys. I remember growing up and watching older movies and singing a lot of cowboy songs, although I had forgotten that a lot of these were sung by Roy Rogers. So when I was doing some research, I was like, oh, gosh, yeah, that's Roy Rogers, like, Whoopie tie yo yo, tumbling, tumbleweeds, cool water, don't fence me in. And of course, the most popular one of them all was Happy Trails, which was a song Roy and his wife Dale used to sing as the theme song for their radio program and in a TV show in the 1950s. <clears throat> so your dad, Roy Rogers, was the only person to be inducted into the Country Music Hall of Fame twice. He also received three stars on the Hollywood Walk of Fame for his work in television television, radio, and film. So let's talk about your dad's early years, where he grew up and how he got his start. Okay. Well, he was born in Cincinnati and they um, tore down where he was born, his childhood home, <clears throat> excuse me, um, and put built a um, stadium riverfront for the Cincinnati team there. Mm-hmm. and Dad would jokingly claim it, claim second base as his home, where his home was. <laughs> so he said he was born. I lived on second, second base. base. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds like his humor, doesn't it? Yes, yes. <laughs> and then they moved to um, the outskirts of Portsmouth. They actually um, built a a houseboat and sailed oh. down the river. And That's moved fun. To works with and with the help of um my grandfather grampy my dad's dad and his blind brother will they built mm. the houseboat and used sheets all tied together to help them with the wind and everything and it shredded what? them and they had to have help to pull the pull it the rest of the way and oh yes there were a wow. lot of stories that <laughs> It's like we're going sailing on our houseboat. Yeah. <laughs> that must so, have been yeah, a journey was... living on a houseboat. Yes, and it was um very um it came at the right time because there was a floods. Well, they've had a couple of really bad floods. And oh, the one yeah. time was that the whole town was flooded and since oh. they were on a houseboat, they just went up with the boat <laughs> and um, <laughs> they ended up ended up um, helping people that were stranded and couldn't get away and their animals Aww. and everything they so yeah it was quite something it ended up being a godsend that houseboat yeah wow yes so the Sly family also sounds fun like it was a talented and fun family describe what went on in their home well, they didn't have TV, so they had to entertain themselves, <laughs> and they were all musical um, people, so they could play different instruments, and they would have friends over, and they liked to uh, play and have hoot nannies and um, fun. just 
it was just a great thing for them to do all the time. So that's so fun. So I was reading that they'd invite neighbors over for square dances and playing mm -hmm. the mandolin and singing, like you said. So excuse me, it sounds like a really fun time. And it was during this time that he also learned to yodel, right? Yes. <laughs> so cool. And he got well, so good at it. I mean, I just love to hear him on his, um, the songs that he yodels on and um, right? he was just, practice makes perfect, I guess. <laughs> Totally. I don't know how they do that. I remember when I was younger trying to mimic oh, the yodeling no. and no, I can't. <laughs> it takes real skill. <laughs> so Roy enjoyed entertaining and eventually appeared on Midnight, Fro Midnight Frolic, a radio show. He then joined a music group called the Rocky Mountaineers, where he was able to use his yodeling skills. And then it was on to Hollywood. Now for a while, he used another pseudonym, right? Yes. Dick Weston, but um, they didn't think it was Western enough. I don't know. But, That's surprising. That um, sounds very Western yeah, to me. Yeah, <laughs> it does to me too. Yeah. And then um, I think when he signed with Republic Studios in 1938, that's when they named him to Roy Rogers, which is a tribute to Will Rogers, who had recently passed away. Is that correct from what you know? From what I know, I've heard that story and I've heard a couple of other stories. So, but that one sounds hmm. more um, plausible. It's, yeah, it sounds right. So, yeah, I mean, it's hard for me to think of Will Rogers passing away before 1938, but he did die in an airplane crash in 1935. And side note, he was Cherokee. So I was reading that in any of your dad's films, if there were Native Americans in the film, he was always a friend to them. However, there may be an exception in Young Wild Bill Hickok, but I, I'm not totally sure. I'd have to watch them all from the beginning and, and to verify that. But your dad seems like such a good man, always trying to bring cheer and hope to the world. Tell us about his visits to uh, the children's hospitals. Oh, um, well, children always had a soft spot in his heart especially those that didn't have a lot um, of, well, that were in the poor countries <laughs> yeah. or uh, counties and mm -hmm. hospitals um, that really, really got to him. I mean, it, he wanted to do whatever he could to help cheer them up in some way. Mm -hmm. And um, he would go um, to visit the hospitals and, um, spend time with the children and even bring trigger in and trigger would be fitted with booties <laughs> oh my and, gosh uh, his horse trigger yeah. would go into the hospital i love it yes. i know it's, it's i i don't think you can see that today <laughs> uh no i don't but. think so you know it's not difficult to see a horse walking up and down the stairs and the hallways I bet the kids loved that i mean i would love that as oh, an adult too yes. much less like yes kids would listen to those radio shows with Roy Rogers and then he's right there in front of them. I mean, it's just, it's amazing that he would do that. What a good man. Um, yeah. So we'll also learn more about his amazing horse trigger later on, but he also learned to fly as well. Correct. Trigger. No, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry. You just sorry. had to. No, I, I know uh -huh, you got your dad's humor. <laughs> oh dear. <laughs> um, Yes, he did. When uh, he was on a flight in Alaska and uh, the pilot had an emergency, medical emergency, and they almost didn't make it. Ooh. And dad thought, okay, you know, I need to learn just in case. So right. yes, he did um, learn how to fly. That's amazing. I, I mean, how did he have time to do all that? I wonder. <laughs> but I know he fitted everything in that he could. It was his life was kind of nonstop <laughs> with no, family he life. So and much energy. Acting and yes, yes. I don't know how people so. do that. Um, I was reading that he also bought a World War II airplane, a Cessna AT um, 17 Bobcat. Is that correct? I'm probably not saying that <laughs> correct, but <laughs> no, I mean, it, it probably is, um, but I'm not really sure about the. The, the styles the of, of anything. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, um, yeah. But 
that's neat. And actually, my um, brother, Dusty, and my sister, Cheryl, are very, um, well, they go out, or they used to, not as much now, but they used to go out on the roads and um, do festivals and talk about all the dates and um, mm. types and and do that for the, a living. And so I'm, and I didn't. <laughs> so Yeah, well, I mean it's a lot of dates to remember. So I don't know how they did yes, that. But it is. <laughs> I, I guess if you're talking about it long enough, it just becomes natural, but mm-hmm. not, to, not to me. I don't remember stuff like that. I have to look at a piece of paper. So um, by the way, <laughs> side note, I noticed that today there are 48 Rogers restaurants in the U.S. and I've never been to one, but I was surprised to see that they're all in the Northeast too. I would have thought they'd be in the I South, know. you know? Yeah, I but, would too. I'm, yeah. But, um... You need one in Alabama. I know. I think they have a new one. They just opened in Ohio. Oh, okay. um, So the next time we go, we're we might yeah jaunt over there. (laughs) Exactly. Have you been to um any of the places his old stomping grounds there in Ohio? Oh, they have a festival there every year, except for last year. But Mm -hmm. um, they uh. They have a festival that that's how I started to get involved in going to festivals. Actually, there's okay. only two, but um, they wanted someone to represent the Rogers family. And Aww. since Dusty and Cheryl were both so busy with everything they were doing, they asked me. And I said, okay, I didn't know what I was getting into. <laughs> but so. Wow. That's so I've so been neat. doing that. Yeah. So they have that festival every year with the exception of probably with COVID. Um, yeah. I would love to go to that festival someday. Are you still going to that every year? Um, we plan on it. They're supposed to have one this year, um, but I haven't got a date yet. Mm. They were thinking of changing the date. It was in August. Okay. But, um, I haven't heard, so I will have to get in touch with them. Yeah. Maybe if you go, I can can head over there and see you and then i'll be going on to oh, that would uh, be great right and to see each other in person because we've only seen each other on zoom yes so. <laughs> <laughs> but, but you know your dad was truly a shining star and so was his wife del evans i don't want to downplay her role too because she was very famous and i'd like to pay tribute to her now by sharing about her career so del evans was a songwriter recording artist actress and singer born Lucille Wood Smith on October 31st, 1912, and she grew up in Uvalde, Texas. In fact, she was the one who wrote the song mentioned earlier, Happy Trails. Um, We're going to get to something about her name, Lucille Wood Smith, in a second, though. So we'll talk more about her personal life in a moment, but she found herself a single mother at a young age in Memphis, Tennessee, and found a job singing and playing piano at some radio stations. Lucille eventually changed her name to Dell Evans in the 1930s and won a contract with 20th Century Fox Studios due to her spotlight as a talented swing jazz and big band singer. I love your mom and dad's story, but their personal lives didn't start out easy. They both went through a few marriages before they finally met each other. And Roy was married two times before Dale. um, And he married Lucille Ascalisi in 1933. And they were married for three years. And then he married Grace Arlene Wilkins in 1936. Now, I'm going to go back to the name Lucille because I have something incorrect there. Her, Her name was actually not Lucille, right? So they had to, it was wrong on her birth certificate or something. Yes, I'm not exactly sure how it got put on there. I maybe they were thinking of it at some time, at some point, but right. her her name was supposed to be <laughs> and is um, Frances Octavia Smith. And right. So I mean, how her, did they get that so wrong? I don't know. They had her date um, being born on the thirtieth, and she was born on the thirty first of October. So. Uh. They, um, I'm not sure when they got it straightened out. They thought they had it straightened out, but when mom tried to go to, I think it was England, 52, mm-hmm. 51, um, they couldn't because they still had the birth certificate or wrong. So, oh my gosh, what a mess! Who was working yeah, at the hospital yeah. that day? <laughs> <laughs> so they finally got it straightened out. <laughs> Yeah, there's somebody, probably someone else's kid that had 
Francis o- Octavia on their, <laughs> on their birth certificate. Did you say it was Octavia or Octavia? Octavia. Octavia. Okay, got it. Um, all right. And so why don't you tell us about Roy Rogers and Grace Arlene Wilkins' uh, children? So they got married and tell us about their journey with their children. Well, when they got married, they were looking forward to having children, but none came. So hmm. um, they decided, well, maybe we'll look into adoption. And dad went to uh, Dallas and he, a couple of friends met up with him and suggested Hope Cottage, hmm. which was an orphanage there in Dallas. And so he looked and um, saw Cheryl and thought she was just such a beautiful baby and Aww. told Arlene about it. And they decided to adopt her and did. And then, as it happens a lot, um, Arlene did get pregnant. And wow. she had Linda, Linda Lou. <laughs> and then um, a few years later, she had Roy Rogers Jr. that they called Dusty. Okay. But, um, fortunately, she passed away from blood clots about three days after he was born. That is so sad. And it must have really been heartbreaking for your dad. Because like yes. now he has three kids he's raising on his own <laughs> and dealing with the recent death mm. of his wife. Wow. So little Cheryl Darlene Rogers was adopted in 1941. And then Linda Lou was born as a miracle baby in 1938. And then Dusty, who's Roy Rogers Jr. He was born in 1950 or 46. Um, So as mentioned, Dale had some struggles early on as well. Um, These are things I didn't know until you and I started talking. Um, So you once told me that she changed her name for certain reasons when she went to from Francis, not Lucille, but Francis to Dale. What was that reason? It was suggested when she was trying to break out into singing, um, get more parts. And they told her that they needed to change her name because Francis just wasn't going to get it out in, okay. the, in the music world. So they named her Dale. And she said she really didn't particularly like it. She said it sounded like a man's name to her. Yeah. But she had told me that she never really cared for it that much. So, um, but she kept it. (laughs) Yeah. Well, and it's funny what a, um, what a, a popular name it became because of her. So, (laughs) but the name Octavia was loved and carried on in your family, right? Yes, um, my daughter named her daughter, um, Tessa. Well, she liked the name Tessa and she wanted to get both the grandma's names in there. So she named her Elizabeth after her father's mother and then Octavia after my mom. So it's Aww. Tessa Elizabeth Octavia. And then Beautiful. Tessa, when Tessa grew up, she has a daughter and named her Dorothy Francis Octavia. <laughs> That's so. so neat. I love that. Well, shout out to Tessa yeah. and and her children and all that too. Yeah. So must be nice to have those beautiful namesakes you know, and all that. So Dale lived a good amount of time before she turned 14. Um, and she's living with her uncle, Dr. L.D. Massey, who was a physician in Arkansas. And I was just curious, there's nothing that I could find. Do you know why she lived with him? I no. <laughs> from yeah, all I mystery heard huh? was that they moved the family moved to Arkansas um because of her uncle asking them um telling them how great it was to um it, the farming was out there and uh-huh. so her dad sold their um hardware store and moved to Arkansas so I thought they all moved <laughs> or lived there. Yeah, so. it's it's just strange when I keep reading about how she lived with her uncle. You know, maybe it was that she only lived with him for a short time. And then when it, her family, moved, I don't know, who knows, but it's kind of a mystery. <laughs> if any of your listeners out there know, let us know. <laughs> um, so in 1927, Dale eloped at the age of 14 with a man named Thomas F. Fox, who was approximately 19 years old. And together they had a son, Thomas F. Fox Jr. 
and she was only 15 years old when she had him. According to Ancestry.com, Tom decided that he and Frances, or Dale as we know her, were too young to be married. So when Tom Jr. was about six months old when Frances went to visit her mother, Tom wrote Frances a letter saying he wanted a divorce, and Frances, again, Dale, was devastated. Had you heard that story as well? Yes, mom had talked to us about it. And he just um, was too young to be yeah. having a family. So that that is young, but she was even much younger. So and she yeah. was a wonderful <laughs> mom. So so Dale then married August Wayne Johns in 1929, and they divorced in 1935. So something I found interesting was while she was contracted with uh, 20th Century Fox, the studio promoted her son, Tom, who was the child she had had with her first husband, and they promoted her, him as her brother. I mean, I get it. It was another time, and they probably didn't want to highlight the fact that she was divorced. But anyway, what do you make of all that? Does she ever talk about that situation? Oh, she talked to us regretfully about having to do that um, because in those days they didn't make as much money as as celebrities do today but um, they were also had to toe the line so to speak Um, and if you want to keep a job get a job you they you did what they told you to do absolutely she had worked very hard. Um, anyhow, she had worked three jobs at one time and um, it wasn't easy and she was alone now and she needed to support um, her son. So yeah. she, she did she, what the studios told her to do. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And she, but she didn't like it at all. <laughs> Yeah, it's kind of funny because it's not like she was, the baby was born out of wedlock or anything like that, which these days wouldn't be a big deal either. But (laughs) back then it would have been a big deal. But even then she had been married and had this baby by her husband. So, um, so that that's, it had to have been really hard for her. And I just really admire her hard work, having three jobs, working for a studio, raising a child. So then she marries a companist, Robert Dell Butts, in 1937, but unfortunately that marriage didn't work out. And by the way, that deception about her son acting as her brother continued until even after her divorce. That poor kid. I so as much as I don't blame Dale for any of that, I just wanted to know, you know, does do you know how Tom Fox Jr., her son, felt about his mother having to say he was her brother? Yes. <laughs> Tom, he was um, such a good and gentle soul at a young age. He had become a Christian, and um, he he was just a fantastic person, brother, father. Um, and he agreed, I mean, that he knew, he understood why she had to do it. But he said the one thing he wouldn't do was lie. So if they hmm. approached him personally he wouldn't lie about it and um right he wasn't he understood but he he didn't like it either so yeah yeah, yeah that makes sense I mean I, I I had always wondered I hadn't really put the timelines together I was like was he even old enough to know she was doing that but I guess I guess he was and but again not Dale's fault so studios did you know strange things back then well and now too <laughs> but it sounds yeah. like Dale I mean seriously <laughs> But it sounds like Dale had some hard times looking for love. But lo and behold, her charming cowboy did come along around the time that Roy's last wife had passed away. He had already made a movie with Dale Evans, and they were in the TV series together, The Roy Rogers Show. So they fell in love, right? Yes. So they had already gotten to know each other. So um, they had made a couple of movies. And actually, she didn't want to become part of the western um, really yeah she uh, like the western world dream, and- yeah her dream was to um be like in chicago and sing the the songs that were um more of a ballroom type and Whoa. things like that so she <laughs> She couldn't get another job, though. I mean, they tried to put her in a couple of other movies after her initial Western um, with Dad. And um, she thought, okay, I can break away now. 
but yeah, it, it didn't. <laughs> it, it just didn't pan out. So she went back to work in the westerns, and she realized that that was kind of her niche. So yeah, she did a good job at that niche. I never knew that she wasn't like super crazy about getting into it in the in the beginning. That's funny. God works in mysterious ways. Yes. So, <laughs> So did your mom and dad ever talk about how he, um, how he courted her or anything? <clears throat> Not a lot. I mean, they were, well, like I said, they had been friends and yeah. she, you know, when Arlene died, uh, mom felt really horrible and um, they kind of gotten to know each other from just being on the movies yeah. and um but no, she doesn't really talk about the courting aspect. Just that she thought he was a very uh, strong humanitarian. He loved children. He was funny. And um, <laughs> so I think that was what was so important to her to find someone that was really um, stable and had a good heart. And yeah. So I think that was really what got her <laughs> she definitely got that from Roy that stable yes. stability and a good man and so the couple decided to marry and join their four children together so again Roy had three and Dell had one and they married in 1947 near Davis Oklahoma at the Flying L Ranch and there seemed to be some funny stories tied to their wedding uh tell us about that well the preacher had a hard time getting there well there was a big snowstorm i okay. mean it was and um you really couldn't get in and out very easily and so they had to bring him on horseback <laughs> and then oh my gosh yeah <laughs> and then there was a uh, when dad was getting ready they there was a accidentally i don't know if it was a lip cigarette or what in the trash can and um <laughs> they, so they started a mini fire <laughs> and had to put that out and dad was late getting down to the to the wedding part but um it was yeah, like where's my groom did he decide not to come <laughs> <laughs> It's, and i love that though because it's so then you know it just seems like they were fun loving and this would happen on their yeah, wedding day yeah. That's great. So I love that. I can just picture it. Um, the Flying L Ranch was in the Arbuckle Mountains. So I bet it was a beautiful wedding. Oh, and by the way, for you listeners, after the wedding, Dale stopped that deception that 20th Century Fox had begun about Tom Fox Jr. being her brother. She put her foot down and was done with that. So three years into the marriage, the entire family was elated with the news that Dale would have a baby. So in 1950, Miss Robin Elizabeth was born to Roy and Dale Rogers. Tell us about the baby. Well, she had Down syndrome um, and developed complications, but the doctor said at that time, um, Down syndrome babies were best to be kept in an institution Aww. where they could take care of them. And uh, mom and dad had decided, well, no, um, we want her home with us. I mean, she's just, she's our child as much as the other kids. and. Um, so we're not going to put her away in a place mm -hmm. that she wouldn't get the love and they wouldn't get the joy of knowing her and raising her. So they brought her home and they didn't hide her from the world. And um, through that, a lot of people have come to realize that just because you're different, that um, you still have a place in this world and um she did have some complications that developed she even got the mumps and mm. um she ended up passing away at the age of two mm. and uh that was that was very hard on them i i just think that that says everything <clears throat> about your mom and dad they were pioneers in both the way they absolutely loved their robin 
their daughter Robin dearly and were determined to raise her on their own um, in a time, like you said, when that was not exactly an acceptable situation. You know, you're supposed to go let the experts handle them in an institution, which is so sad. And so they were pioneers in that way and also in the way that they adopted. And we'll talk about that adoption part a lot. So listeners, be sure to take a listen to part two, as there's a lot more you're going to want to hear about the journey of this family through both love, sorrow, and good times. Thank you, Dodi. Thank you. Thanks for listening to Native Chalk Talk. Be sure to join our community on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn. Simply search for Native Chalk Talk. That's Native, C-H-O-C-T-A-L-K. And check us out at nativechalktalk.com. Stay tuned for the next episode. You're going to love it. Yakoki. Thank you, my friends.